Took it off. Lost it. Really? How did you do that? Okay, let's have some fun, bitch. <sighs> All right. <laughs> All right. Should we do? Shall I do a small intro? Cool. Do you have your phone charged for research propositions? Yes. For research shit. Please. Yeah. <laughs> okay, guys. Welcome. Um, this episode is only with the two of us. Uh, Arne and me. We thought about couple of things what we want to do with this podcast also where it's going to because we have the we have the podcast now for the third episode it's now six weeks uh, since we're doing this so we thought a little bit hey where is this baby going to uh, what shall we do um, what are we actually talking about because what I don't like about different kind of wine podcast is that it's always a different topic but if you're a beginner with wine or with natural wine you actually never knows you never know where it where it uh, begins or where it begun for some people and what are the reasons why people actually drink natural wine you start with podcasts and all of a sudden you're going in the middle of uh, Loire or in the middle of Burgundy or in the middle of, of some topics and then you have all those sommeliers sitting there and they're talking about I don't know acidity levels and kind of vintages but you actually don't know where it where it began so today we are we chose some wines which changed for us the natural wine world or yeah, which our taste in our taste, which which yeah. made they, us they switch. didn't change the natural wine world, yeah, but they did for us. us, yeah. So we thought before we're going on with the podcast and and interviewing people or or talk with different wine importers and give their um, and get their opinion, we thought about some wines which changed a little bit for us. Over, we thought like, okay, this is where we really flip the switch. As I said from the beginning on, we're not gonna review any wines or something. We just want to share with you a little bit the discussions or the conversations what we are having. And uh, today I brought uh, a wine where I said, okay, this really flipped the switch for me, where I completely fell in love with the topic. Uh, Iron also brought something where he said like, okay, this is really something where, where kind of I more understood uh, natural wine. Uh, today we're gonna taste three different wines. We're gonna start with the reds first and then we're gonna have a nice aligoté for the thirst. For dessert. Um, for dessert. So yeah, enjoy the podcast. Um, and this is Barnold, episode three. You want a pillow? You want a music? <laughs> yeah, I really would like some background music. A pillow? No, it's, uh, it's a little bit early. First wine, which changed a shitload for me. Domaine Bobinet Ruben, Saint-Mur Champigny. So it's coming from the Loire, France, south from Paris. Uh, Saint-Mur is in the middle of the Loire. It's uh, next to Anjou, which is one of my favorite cities in the world. Um, and this is something where it completely changed the natural wine game for me. Uh, you know Bobinet? I've been it. there, uh, no, yeah, so we went there. Um, the importer here, Marnix, uh, he invited us, this Ladi, for, um, you, I told, sent you the picture, right? The, the, the clips at, um, at their domain for a drinking binge party. Yeah. So we came there, it was, uh, I think, 100 bottles of their, um, of their bubble wine was open and uh, it went fucking crazy French people screaming only Comté cheese only uh, wine and I think we stayed there for two two and a half hours met a lot of interesting people nice actually I have to be honest I have never in my life sold a bottle of Bobinet okay and I've never drank a whole bottle is there a reason for it that you never finished a bottle or no I never bought a bottle okay I never ordered it so I probably got a glass left right tasted it a multitude of times yeah but for me uh, I, I never ordered it for mm -hmm. some reason I don't know never had that attraction mm -hmm. for some maybe Domain Bobinet started uh, started for me actually yeah as some or you especially know I worked for a, a wine importer in, in Austria Weinskandal uh, with Moritz Herzog um, and when we of course we started with Matassa <laughs> we started with Matassa <laughs> and uh, with the classics and then we started to to build up our portfolio um, and one of the yeah um, first big things or the second wave when we really started to import some more shit and go really into depth of the portfolio we uh, uh, took the plane and flew to france and made a really nice tour from loire how many, burgundy how many years ago was this 
um, I think seven years ago. Yeah, it's when when actually natural wine started in Austria. You know, you had uh, Rosanitz and or Roxanitz, as some know, orange wine. This was starting to build up, and I was working as a sommelier at that time. I left my job, and then Moritz called me, and he said, "Hey, I'm starting this company called Weinskandal. Do you wanna wanna join me and and build you this up with me?" Met him before. I met him before because he was working for Panobile, um, ah. and on the side he started to already okay. import some wine, um, and he's also one of the part owners of Domain Ribarach in Roussillon yeah. um, and then he yeah met Tom Lübe there and he made uh, Gobi there and, and then he came in touch with natural wine and okay. he really fell in love with it and thankfully he put me on he got me on board and he gave me something to taste immediately I fell in love with it but I needed a little bit more time and then we took the plane flew to Loire flew to uh, went to uh, Chablis Burgundy Jura went to all those crazy guys and we also went to Domaine Bobine and it was one of the first... You flew to Loire? No, no, no. <laughs> In the private jet. Yeah, yeah exactly, the uh, helicopter. Yeah. <laughs> and um, uh, we visit Do Domaine Bobinet and I don't know her name. W what's her name? Um, uh, it's the ballet dancer. Uh, yeah, it's the former dancer. The second really wife. Crazy right. woman, super nice. Yeah, beautiful um, lady. And we went there, visit the cellar, and I was trying all the wines from her, like uh, Ruben and Hanami and Le Grouge, the white one. And she's making super nice, vibrant, peppery Chenin Blancs. And super, as you maybe already taste, overripe Cabernet France. This is not really super tight and, and really like peppery and really heavy. I must it's say we are, soft. we are drinking this at pretty low temperature, I think. Yeah. But for you, this wine, this, this winery st still stands out in mm. uh, Loire. Mm. Yeah, you have, uh, you have um, when you have the Loire, to explain Saumur a little bit, when you have the Loire, you actually have two major cities in the middle. You have Anjou yeah. and you have Saumur. And Anjou is always, as I got it explained from, from the guys there, Saumur is always white chalk and Anjou is black chalk. That's of course super yeah, um, cliche. Yeah. But Anjou is always a little bit more oxidative, overripe apple, a little bit more um, juicy, a little bit more overripe. And Saumur is always a little bit more precise. A little bit more white peppery, a little bit greener, a little bit fresher, a little bit easier. Yeah. And Domaine Bobinet makes actually two different kinds of, or they make a lot of different red wines, but they make, to give a little bit of understanding, they make one wine, which is called Hanami, which is Cabernet Franc, which is more like the fresh, so the precise... Japanese name? It is, but I have no idea what the story oh. behind it. <laughs> Hanami is more the, the fresh Cabernet Franc. Anecdote this there. <laughs> it's more like the Cabernet Franc <laughs> fresh thingy. And then you have Ruben. And Ruben is more, okay, a little bit more oaky okay and overripe. And when you try this, it's not really this easy. So I understand that you're saying you never drank a whole bottle because this is always a little bit more overripe. If somebody would, if I would taste this looking for natural wine, you know, this is more the, the grown up stuff, you know, that we are starting to really appreciate. It's not the kind of wine that the people that are looking for natural, natural wine now maybe um, are expecting. But the drinkability, it's obviously very pure, very well made. It's it's a pretty dreamy bottle of Cabernet Franc. Yeah. Mean, you know, if you compare it to maybe more expensive things like Sansonet and stuff. Hmm? Sansonet, Antoine Sansonet. I don't know that one. Uh, well, it's more expensive and it's not as natural. But for this price range, because how much is it? Where can we get it? Maxi Vin. Super cool wine importer. I just went there today, um, a la minute actually, to Marnix. And Marnix is, is importing the whole portfolio of Bovine since ever, forever. Yeah. And he's not just making sherry picking, but he's really yeah, yeah. importing the whole shit. But he cares a lot about this relationship uh, with yeah. the winemakers. I can yeah. truly notice. But how much was it? Uh, thir no, no, no. It's, it's the other one was 30, I think it was 14 euros. 14, 15, 16 euros? For a consumer, including tax. You go there and you buy it, including tax, boom. Ah, well, yeah. look, 14 euros. I would euros say 16 euros. For a very, very well-made bottle of Cabernet Franc from Saumur. So yeah. not some, uh, like Anjou used to be more cheap, but now it's hip, so it's not so much anymore. Yeah. But uh, Saumur is like a pretty classic name, so well, good good to them. And it's just by the river as well. Eh? They're yeah. just off the Loire River. This is what you I wanted to ask. Well, huh? This is what I wanted to ask because I was there, yeah, seven eight years ago, and you went. I mean, you you see the Loire, and it's just a couple of meters up the hill, and then you walk 
up to the to the winery and then you go into this beautiful cave yeah but the road is like this this tight yeah and i asked her like how the fuck are you gonna are you selling pellets from here yeah. and she was like yeah we can't and also marnix told me and you told me because you went there when i was there there was only this house on top yeah, yeah, yeah. and they really are struggling with delivery and now they rebuild it yeah and you were there two years ago this year no this year so Just how did this, it change uh, so if you drive from the city center out to them yeah. it's probably five minutes from the center of some yeah. I think where you go up the road to their winery, yeah. just on the left is a huge parking place with a brand new calf with big logistic facility, big ass tasting room, really nice. Uh, you can we could there was like a hundred cars parked in front, so really well taken care of for the future. I think for them to grow and uh, there was I think they still do some cuvées upstairs, but probably the the majority uh, at least maybe the, the the production side of it is done downstairs mm-hmm. um yeah and uh, also the guy i spoke to the young winemaker he, they said they could use tanks there as well so mm-hmm. maybe they have a little bit of uh, extra capacity i don't know but it was uh was downstairs so we didn't have to go up the hill drunk and even more drunk down the hill it was perfect cool i have to say um so for the wine yeah very pretty classic i don't really get the farmish side and you can get with uh, Cabernet like farm the, the like stinkiness the, yeah or the, like the, the more earthy well the early notes are there but mm-hmm. I think mostly the fruit is just so well balanced and uh, how much alcohol is this uh, 13 and a half nah, I think never say that. I think it is really really nice but it's really over uh, overripe positively yeah. but it's really on the overripe side so when you said in the beginning I actually never finished the bottle I can yeah. completely relate the reason that it it changed things for you did it change the way yep. you you felt that natural wine could be this classically good and still be naturally made or what was the what because you always talked about that bobby now you always said oh yeah, bobby, yeah. i fucking love it i fucking it sings yeah. get down but what is that 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 feeling that when you taste this yeah it's you could sell it or you can understand it or mm-hmm. for me for me Bobinet was the uh, when i drank natural wine un- uh, until that time it was always black or white so i always had rojonitz which was like orange and super macerated then i drank uh, el bandito from testa longa the south african guy who is at that time i think he's been macerating for 24 months 36 months really heavy i never tasted it till two vintages ago so. yeah then i drank uh, what was it called the domain octava yeah the panina yeah. which is also really heavy and, and really um oh, super ripe yeah and, and really heavy natural stuff yeah. not heavy from oh, the alcohol also, but yeah. really a brick in the face and bobinet was the first wine where i was there where she was a really normal woman really friendly yeah. really normal the the cellar looked actually really normal it looks like a really big nice domain can also stand in the middle of burgundy yeah. and you can sell Merceau for 100 euros yeah. but then i tasted the wines and i was like okay this is without sulfur this is really vibrant it does a lot to my body i want to drink more and at the same time it was really solid classic stuff did you ever ask them how they how they got moved into making natural wine Never. because i think he's from a natural wine family i have no idea i really don't know what interests me because you almost suspect that he's yeah, uh, that he's inspired by these guys like Sansonnet, Breton. Yeah. Maybe the guys that were working clean, yeah. but didn't make uh, quote unquote natural wine. And 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 the the thing with or this is the thing what I it's funny because in the first episode we talked about that you only like natural wine and then you said like I yeah you think it's bullshit <laughs> and I I don't think it's bullshit but uh, for me wine still needs to be a good product and I just don't like to be one of the guys who says like i drink natural wine because it's cool no. but it should be solid stuff and bobinet was always for me solid stuff do you still do you still remember um i mean i was always i was always uh, since my the age of 15 i was always kind of in the wine business and, and i worked in hordy kind then i went into wine import and i worked at wine and co and da-da-da. i was always in touch with wine and i developed but you actually you always drank wine and you always liked wine um but there was a certain moment when you not completely switched to natural wine but all of a sudden you saw like hey man this shit does something to me uh, it's a when was your point where you said like for me it was different was it Rutger? no yeah but it's a different story because where you were in high-end horeca and in restaurants you know where you were doing uh working with wine i did a lot of this until i was about 19 
and I was always interested. And but I started working just in regular bars and eating like some, like eating shacks and stuff that were easy yeah. going. And a lot of beer was going out, yeah. and wine was just for the whole Pinot Grigio or Sauvignon Blanc. Uh, and everywhere I came, I still always asked to do some nice bottles. So even when I worked at 19 at a small bar. I went to the wine importer and I got some nice bottles of Montepulciano mm -hmm. and some bottles of Chablis just to be able to do at least something with it. Yeah. But my professional side, uh, outside from uh, cheap or kind of cheap wine, was lost for years until I started were doing a wine course with a guy called Theo who worked with uh, what's the Grape District for a long time after. He still works there, I think started getting some more wines there did a wine course and the guy said you know for a chef for um you need to drink two chenin blancs as homework get a chenin blanc at the uh, grape district because that's where i used to go sorry well, how old were you 21 21 okay so it's 12, two years ago 12, 13 years ago yeah 10 kilos ago and then uh 20 maybe even uh but around the corner from where i lived was also a new wine shop but it was more high-end and the guy in there looked not very approachable but i went in and i got a bottle of chenin blanc i paid my ass off i think like 28 euros yeah. and it was six years old and when i opened it all this kind of shit came out it looked like a lava lamp <laughs> and um but i remember later i remember drinking it and it blew my mind like i couldn't understand it what was it do you remember no okay no. and this bottle i still can remember the taste and what it looked like and what happened when i drank it and the bottle of the other shaming block from great i have no fucking clue but that was probably the first time i bought a bottle of natural wine completely by chance and accident and what did it okay you drank it because i think yes okay i'm gonna speed it up Then I had some bars. Then I did only shit wine. And then I did Panache, which is a more high-end restaurant. So I was the owner there doing a lot of the work on the floor. And the brother of the sous chef worked in a restaurant. I got there for food, which was amazing. The Nieuwe Winkel in Nijmegen, probably for me, one of the five best restaurants in Holland, period. And uh, back in the time, seven years ago, uh, Rutger van der Poel, the, co the chef's little brother, he gave me f six or seven courses with natural wine. And it just the whole thing of that food with that wine, it was like, what the fuck have I been drinking? It Sorry, it, it was in, in which restaurant? The Nieuwe Winkel. The Nieuwe Winkel. Rutger worked there as a sommelier. Yeah. And he gave you, Arjan, you were my guest today, seven course menu, I make your wine pairing, my, shut the fuck up. Yeah, with my father, okay. who, who ate the decorations on the plate. <laughs> no, well, <laughs> it was like, hey, underneath an egg. And he was like, <laughs> <laughs> like, we were talking to Rutger and then we were looking, and my dad was like, the hey, egg. And I was like, so I got uh, Rutger to come to Pora Panache, which was quite an <laughs> achievement. And with Rutger, I developed more taste for it. And Long story, sorry guys, I talk too much and no. Who main Bobine? Ruben. Whoever, someone who, try, who, who likes to have heavy wine, who likes it a little bit more ripe, who likes it over mature, who likes it a little bit more oaky, this is your shit. We're gonna down it. Get down! Get down. Uh, this smells so perfumed. Should we order some food later on? What should we do? Pizza bitch. Alright. Something changed. Back at it again. But you brought today Matassa? Yes. It's not his most fancy cuvee, but it's fucking good. <laughs> Domain Matassa comes from Tom Lübe. Tom Lübe, South African guy who went to Roussillon to do wine here. Languedoc Roussillon. Languedoc Roussillon, who does Domain Rayas Majas. Ma Majas. Oh, the, the I think he did something before. Yeah, he, yes, he did a he did a daughter. wine on his own where he was the cellar master. He fell in love with the daughter of Domingo B. Oh, they got okay. married, and then he said like, "I'm gonna stop with Rayas Majas," or he still does it, and now he does only Domain Matassa. Why did it change your life? I was obviously looking for more uh, exciting stuff, and right about that time that we opened, Figo started Cyferweine and they were selling Matassa. Honestly, his whites, his muscats, 
that were probably my real introduction. This type of Muscat wines, super aromatic, like the, the white version of this and the Marguerite. And pff, Jesus Christ, whatever he does with that stuff, it's amazing. We were selling these wines, but I could use these wines so good to change around people's minds about natural wine. So what, what this wine is to me, it's a light red. It's super light, enjoyable, hearty, drinkable stuff. Most of all, most of all that is different. I can give all the analysis in the world, but this is just fucking juice. It's Grenache Noir, Grenache Gris, I think. It's Syrah, and there's some Macabeo inside. Yeah. It's fun as fuck. It's stable. There's never mouse, or at least I never had it with this wine. It's got energy. It's clinging to me, whatever. I can barbecue with it. I can eat a pizza with it. I can drink it at 6 o'clock in the morning after I got completely fucked up. And I really appreciate still these classic cuvées. Honestly, they're still some of the best coming yeah. from that region. But his his fucking rock and roll bottles, like uh, also El Carner, and you have the one with the fucking blood moon on it. I'm not even keeping up with all the shit he's doing. The dude with the sunglasses. I really need to do an in-depth tasting again. But you already know, whenever we go to Paris, and it's 11 and we had dinner and we want to spike things up bam we order fucking matassa because yeah. one thing the guy always delivers is he delivers he delivers, he delivers and it's energy yeah. it's stable it yeah. never fucking lets you down maybe this bottle changed my way of thinking now i think about it about drinking wine like binge drinking wine <laughs> Like you could, we could always drink wine. We could drink this, but after a bit you want a beer and you go to a bar and you drink some other shit. Yeah. But maybe this wine and the other ones from Matassa played a huge role in keeping us not from going to a bar after work because we, we rather always drink this opposed from 10 beers. And honestly, if I would go to a bar now and I, if somebody would tell me, okay, you don't have to drink beer, you can bring your own bottle. I would probably, nine out of ten times, still bring, bring bobina. <laughs> yeah, and drink super heavy show beer shit. I'm, I'm a little bit, poof, I have to take a chase. Okay. Good. Can we smoke on video? We can, if we can smoke. Sorry, man. Um, oh, I went to went to uh, yeah to Marnix today and bought the Bovine and then I also asked him like what kind of white should we drink and he said hey take this from Durieux Jan Durieux Jan Durieux Love and Piff 100% Aligoté or as I call it Aligoter uh, Nixon Chenin Blanc my favorite grape I love it it's always the the super uh, easy to drink fresh uh, grape the trash grape from Burgundy which some wineries made uh, good stuff out of it. So, guys, quite an iconic label setup. I think most people that ever go to a natural wine bar will recognize this. Uh, Jan Dudieu, uh, as we said earlier, but maybe we're gonna cut it out. It's an Aligoté. Uh, not the most noble of white grapes, probably, in the Burgundy, but a grape that I will choose over uh, a Chardonnay probably nine out of 10 times. Mm. A natural winemaker. A short introduction to Alicote. Um, Alicote, we had it in the first episode when we talked about uh, Weltschriesling and Blauer Wildbach and all these kind of things. Alicote was always a little bit of a trash grape from, from France or from Burgundy. Like you really only did it in masses and never, never really on quality. That's what Chardonnay was for. And then uh, some winemakers picked up Alicote and said this is actually a cool grape. We should pick it up and, and make something really good out of it. And then it actually completely hit the, the natural wine scene. And now a lot of natural winemakers are starting to make aligoté. And aligoté is always here to drink. It doesn't matter how much alcohol it has. Aligoté is always to down. But how do you... We should eat a pizza part together. But how do you um, see that? Because for me, it's very lo logical. The, um, if you're in Burgundy and you make the choice to make natural wine, yeah. which grape are you going to play with? Yeah. Which grape are you going to use? 
to express your own emotion are you going to use chardonnay your money maker the thing that feeds your babies and your wife and make sure that you can make wine next year or are you going to use a, a grape that they won't use anyway absolutely yeah you're 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 right yeah you never know uh i have no idea no idea i think it's also it also depends on what kind of one winery you're you're taking over what is already in the vineyard it's not like hmm it's not like a ice ice cream store where it was like hey tomorrow i'm gonna do chardonnay and then next year i'm oh, gonna do aricote um but i but back if, you, if you're an ice cream store and you want to try out things you're not gonna do it with your vanilla ice cream no that's true uh, aricote yeah for me this is a um this is an interesting wine yeah. it's super clean it's super cool but Honestly, singing, or as you would say, you know, or for me, like really hitting the spot energy wise, not so much. Maybe it's also not that kind of wine. You know, this wine is made for proper enjoyment, uh, proper taste profile. It's really good. Technically, you would probably could say all kinds of things about this wine. But to say it really now, after the, it's the third bottle, but it still doesn't quite catch me this but it's Does also it catch you but it's also it, it's you, also not do you have more experience with the uh, the wine from your video or not at all i don't i don't um but i i don't think that's that's what the wine um wants to be and this is something where you have True. to be really careful when you when you buy wines you should be aware of what actually is the meaning of the wine so for example everyone drinks matassa comme de lula and ola rouge and everyone is like oh this is so nice to drink um, and also when you drink young bobines like Hanami, it's like, oh, that's really nice to drink. But what if they are going a little bit more into depth, using some oak, using uh, all the vineyards, going a little bit higher in alcohol. And also, I mean, you buy a aligote for 30 euros. Uh, this is not just your daily juice. No. This is, there's something more meaning in it. So it's a deep, it's a deep aligote. Exactly. And when we're, when we're drinking wine, you're of course, right, we always right. look, look for juice and this still has juice, but I think it's just take it up a notch and, and get a little bit uh, on a higher level. And this is where we just have to be aware of, okay, the wines we took today, only the Matassa, Ola Rouge, is really the uh, daily drug, the, the daily juice. This is actually something serious where you really have to think about, okay, what's the meaning of it? How can you use it? And, 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 and that's a different thing. So what we actually want to do in the podcast is, we, of course, we want to drink three bottles. Um, but here, today, we're kind of stuck, especially with the Ruben and now with the Alicote. Mm -hmm. But there is a reason behind it. And there's nothing to do with um, that we just don't like it, but it's just more serious. No, I would never say the there's anything wrong with this bottle. No, absolutely And not. actually, I kind of like this part maybe of our podcast and about us drinking together. Is that I go always far too fast and straight to the point of a wine mm -hmm. where I kind of maybe miss the point of a wine sometimes. Mm -hmm. Whereas what you just said made me maybe realize that for an Aligote, this is a pretty special wine mm -hmm. because it's got, it still carries the characteristics, the characteristics that make Aligote for me. Mm -hmm. Minerality, uh, freshness, low alcohol. Um, but he seems to have added expressiveness, body even, which is quite extraordinary for 11% alcohol aligote. Um, and it still has a lot of uh, drinkability. Mm -hmm. So maybe in a way it's a very big aligote and I compare it in the wrong way. Mm -hmm. but. Thinking about wine like this, when I think it in my first response, hearing your reaction and then rethinking what I'm mm. drinking, mm. works pretty well. That's always in conversations like this, right? Yeah, well, that's Bar Arnold. <laughs> what do you, what do you, what do you think? Um, uh, do you see since the first time you drank natural wine and where it is now? Do you see any developments, or do you see, hey, this is where natural wine is heading to? Well. Of course, but as uh, uh, the same I see with food and with service and with uh, all these things that are happening. Um, but with natural wine, there is obviously, especially uh, here in Holland at this, when we started our first conversation uh, before starting Partizan, we could talk about uh, Bach, maybe Hartering and Schuh. 
and uh, I think Glue Glue just started. But um, there was no reference for natural wine in Amsterdam, and especially not doing it in a not uh, in a pretty like commercial kind of uh, restaurant. <laughs> so let's do an outro. <laughs> This was the most fucked up and best <laughs> ever. <laughs> ever. Yeah, let's oh. wrap it up. Let's let's wrap it up. But there is no wrap up to do today. We talked about the wines, it's perfect. That's done. End of no, story. I just want Yeah. It's Bazanji. Now we're not. Check it, check it, uh. I said this industry is dog eat dog. And y'all sleeping. All these Mickey D's rappers around me that I've been eating. Cause I got my city. Y'all